Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining our roundtable round um, this afternoon. And the subject of today's uh, meeting is crime, justice and rehabilitation. And this is the final session of our Leveling Up Commission um, at this stage before we move into what's known as our sprint stage. Um, so once again, um, thank you for joining this afternoon. We are joined by some of our commissioners. So we have Anita Dockley, we have um, Neil Carmichael. Hi, Neil and we also are joined by Lara Newman as well and they'll be they'll be given the opportunity um, once we've heard from our panellists this afternoon to ask some questions and um, just to note we have also received some pre-submitted questions um, which we if we get the opportunity we'll be speaking to those as well. Um, so moving on to the panel for the first panel session for this afternoon um, it is on prevention and community building. So this panel will apply a preventative lens to understand how the criminal justice framework can work, can work with and across socio-economic systems to reduce the volume of people entering the system. This lens takes a community building approach and proposes that strong support structures and policy reforms prevent individuals from falling out of the social system and entering to prison. By tackling the different causes of individuals falling into the penal system, such as health, education and housing inequalities, a reduction in the number of crimes and offenders can be achieved. Developing supportive public service structures would consequently place less burden on the penal system and help keep citizens altogether outside of it. Now, these public service structures can refer to community-led service delivery, such as community-oriented policing. This strategy of policing focuses on developing relationships between police and community members, as opposed to reactive policing strategies, which may lead to increased intention between offenders and police, worsening the load on the penal system. So ensuring a collaboration between police and the community emphasizes a guardian mindset where officers see themselves as part of the community they serve, working side by side with the community to create a safe, livable and vibrant community. Okay, so um, the panel um, can address communities and its vulnerable populations in a host of ways. Um, so the session can identify vulnerable populations and address them as a reference point to the penal system. For example, disadvan disadvantaged, vulnerable, marginalised adolescents and marginalised youths at risk of entering the criminal justice system and facing social and economic exclusion. And research indicates several health and wellbeing inequalities experienced by this section of the population that often leads them to commit crimes. So on this afternoon's um, panel. We are joined by um, Tom McNeil, who is the Assistant Police and Crime Commissioner from the West Midlands region. We're also joined by Rihanna Taylor, um, who is the CEO of Circles of Support, and Dr Theo, um, who is the founder of Restorative Justice for All. So really looking forward to hearing from each of you this afternoon. We could ask you to speak uh, for, for roughly five minutes or so. Um, if you want to use a presentation, that's absolutely fine. Um, but equally, if you're just talking, that's fine too. Um, so may we start with you, Tom, please? Thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to kind of set out some of our thinking on these things. <clears throat> when I had a, a look at the briefing, um, it, it opens up just so many things we are passionate about and we'd like to talk about. So I've tried to condense, well, I will condense it to something fairly brief. But obviously, there's much, much more we could talk about and we'd be interested in talking about it. And there's an awful lot of documentation we could send, but we didn't want to bombard you with it if it's not necessarily going to get read or be interested, uh, interesting for you. So I'll kind of take it from you after this as to what you'd like to see or not. Um, just very brief introduction has already been said. I'm Assistant Police and Crime Commissioner for the West Midlands and I, I'm sure you know what the role is, but it's to partly to ask very difficult questions of the police. Uh, and accountability of effective use of policing powers and just efficiency and all of that. But we very much embrace the other part of our role as well, which is to really try and invest in innovative ways of supporting communities and preventing crime. And obviously public health is a very broad definition, but we truly embrace it in its fullest sense. And I'll touch upon some of those here. Um, and, and also we have used the position to make sure that we're in forum, forums which aren't always uh, taken advantage of by police and crime commissioners. They are by some, but not by all. And so, for example, we sit on a number of different NHS boards. 
uh, and I sit on, for example, the National Family Drug and Alcohol Advisory Courts Advisory Board and things like that, just to really get a lot of breadth about things which aren't technically policing and crime, but nearly always have a strong relationship with. So I've tried to dissect my thinking into kind of two key asks, really. These are asks for anybody who is in a position of real power to effectively change the landscape. And we really think it does need changing it from a, a preventing crime perspective. So I'll start with the first one. The first one is we think, well, we know, and it's not brand new to this contemporary era. We know there's been great examples in the past, some things that have survived, some things that have lost. But we think there needs to be a mandated emphasis on policing to take seriously community rehabilitation. And by that, I mean, when you've got an example of a project which diverts people in possession of drugs, found in possession of drugs towards health, it needs to be something that doesn't die away at the whims of a particular chief constable or police and crime commissioner, and not something that is a nice to have or a bonus activity for police forces and community policing, but something upon which they are measured as to whether they're a successful police force or not. So in hammering home this point about mandating the role of policing to ensure community rehabilitation happens, as opposed to pushing more people through a terribly failing criminal justice system, I'm going to give a couple of quick examples of best practice and then how I think we should try and mandate for them. So we've got New Chance, which is, and I'm really paraphrasing here, for vulnerable women who would otherwise go to prison, but instead get diverted to a women's centre-led um, support service. It's led in partnership between a Birmingham Women's Centre called Anna Wim and also Black Country Women's Aid because it's across the whole West Midlands. And in a nutshell, it provides truly holistic support for the multiple array, array of issues that are facing these women, which won't be news to you, but domestic abuse, victimisation, sense misuse, mental ill health, poverty, really trying to support that in a long-term way through a trusted relationship. Um, in contrast to a punitive punishing system, whether it's imprisonment or otherwise, for people who quite frankly have been a victim of systemic failure. We've got a couple of other programmes that borrow from those principles. So. We've got divert, not as sophisticated as new chance, but that is for anybody of any age found in possession of any drug. Could be heroin, could be crack cocaine. Normally for the first couple of times. And before, whereas they might have been given a criminal record or put through some kind of justice route, or at least given a record of some kind, they're now diverted towards education and support. There's lots we could do to enhance the sophistication of that, but it's been a great movement away from punishing people, quite frankly, for something that's definitely a health issue. We've got a similar kind of behavioural change programme for, and I'm always cautious about using the word low level because all domestic abuse is heinous, obviously, but lower level, non-violent, abusive behaviour for men predominantly uh, to go on a behavioural change programme. And it's been extremely effective at reducing uh, re-offending for that. There's obviously a lot more complexity to that program and I wouldn't want to overstate its effectiveness but these are the kind of things we've put in place all been evaluated all really good now the problems it's a total postcode lottery with this some police officers know about it some don't sometimes they refer some don't there's a bit of institutional racism as to who gets referred to it and who doesn't being honest with you um, there's a lack of institutional memory so you can have this great program which is being used and then new officers come in or new leadership roles come in and they forget it exists or the commissioning round ends and it disappears. And then sometimes there's a bit of a cultural barrier to it. So Westminster Police is a massive organisation. There's a few different departments that could make referrals, for example. Sometimes some do, others don't. They're not all singing from the same hymn sheet or it ebbs and flows. And the solutions, I think, are a complete sea change in how we measure whether a police force is effective or not. Um, it should be part of how they're assessed. It should be treated as a major pillar of whether a police force is good and not just a little extra thing that HMIC ask about if they remember. Uh, and I think we should see uh, there having to be something in the like of assistant chief constables having to be responsible for it and taking leadership on it. At the moment, it's just all uh, too much kind of luck as whether a police force takes it seriously. Now, I am going to wrap up in the next minute or two because I know I'm almost at time, but I'll try and get through these bits quickly. To really be effective community rehabilitation, 
we need agencies to be working much better together. Lots of agencies are trying. I know there's the Combating Drugs Partnership, which is a government initiative to get local agencies to commission together. There's the integrated healthcare systems and all of that. It's great stuff. I'm glad it's happening and I hope it continues to evolve. But again, I think we need to look at some more mandated requirements. Perhaps when you're looking at your most vulnerable cohorts, so anybody with addiction problems, housing problems, uh, domestic abuse, the cohorts where there's multiple complex needs, of which agencies have a fair amount of knowledge about, maybe different agencies should have to sign off on each other's budgets at the same time so that we really are making sure that each agency is trying to pull resources where they can and not just go ahead and have some nice uh, talking shop conversations, but never really finding the space or time or the impetus to shift how they're doing it. Now, I'm going to move on really quickly to my second point, and I'll wrap up soon after that. The other thing I think we need to see uh, mandated, and mandated because it's happening in good pockets of work, but then it disappears again, or it doesn't happen everywhere, and it's a postcode lottery, is really high quality pastoral support in schools. I've seen examples that are truly brilliant, and they're brilliant because they build long term relationships with children and their families. They're non stigmatizing, they're respectful, they don't have an automatic end date because complex problems don't get solved quickly. And they try to tailor work around, again, multiple complex issues from debt to, again, trying to escape domestic abuse. I've seen some of this great work. When it's in place, it does reduce school exclusions, it does prevent crime. It does help people escape abusive contexts and it does help people into work. But I think we need um, all schools to be mandated and local authorities to be mandated to ensure there is a truly uh, holistic pastoral support mechanism in all schools. Unless really the stats are saying the need isn't there, which can't be that many places. Um, and I think this needs to have two elements to it. There needs to be local accountability on all schools, whether they're academies or otherwise, because you shouldn't be able to have some schools which just don't believe it's their role at all to ensure this pastoral support happens and then think it's OK to permanently exclude. But equally, schools with limited resources, very pressurised teachers and reduced school budgets shouldn't be expected to magic up this support. So there should be an equal duty on local authorities to provide it. And any sensible government would also recognise the economic imperative of investing in this in a meaningful way as well. So it does need to come with an investment package. And I do believe if we had something which didn't leave it up to the whims of progressive areas, it really was a core objective of education. I think we'd radically reduce uh, crime and create all sorts of economic and social well-being. I do have some other nuances. I can drop out if questions on it, but I've realised I've kind of come to time already. So. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. That was absolutely fascinating. And I'd love to talk some more about the prospect of having uh, obligatory pastoral support in, in schools. Um, so thank you um, again. And hopefully um, when we come to questions, there might be more opportunity to, to bring some more of that out. Um, I do apologise. I, 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 it was remiss of me when I um, started this meeting this afternoon. I don't think I actually introduced myself. So um, so my name is Paula Sheriff. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a former MP and, and shadow minister. And also um, for the purposes of these meetings, I'm working uh, with Curia as the chair of the National Committee. Commission, the Commission on Leveling Up. Um, so I do, do apologise for that omission. Um, so um, uh, just to remind uh, anybody um, who's on the call today that you can use the chat function if there's something that you'd like to put in there, something to remind you that you'd like to raise something a bit later on in the meeting. And additionally, you can also um, send written evidence to us. And I'll ask Ben to kindly pop an email address in the chat box now. And then if anybody would like to send email anything in, um, we'd be more than happy to receive that. Thank you. So in terms of the format, we'll hear from all three panelists panelists first and then we'll move on to questions if that's okay um so um, may we now move on to rihanna are you there rihanna thank you very much um, good afternoon everyone i'm i'm here and thank you um very much for giving uh, me the opportunity to contribute just to clarify i'm the ceo of circles uk that's the organization and 
we uh, oversee circles of support and accountability, which is uh, programs for people who sexually harm others or who have convictions for sexual offences. So just to clarify that, and we have a whole range of providers who deliver these programs in the community. But also just Thanks. to say... We'll, we'll, we'll make sure that's reflected in, in, the, <laughs> um, in the notes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paula. And um, But just also to say, I have a long background, a long career in criminal justice for my sins. So even though my current focus is very much on people with convictions for sexual offences, I have worked with a whole spectrum of crime and uh, offence types, so can actually speak um, within that context quite comfortably. So just in terms of, you know, a few thoughts from from me, and I, I thought um, Tom really uh, introduced the session really well with some really interesting and thought-provoking ideas. I was sort of linked to some of those as well in, in, in my input. I think um, for me just to note that actually as a country, I think we're notoriously bad at prevention um, and um, we are incredibly reactive. You know, we work a lot with um, European partners in, in, in our work. And when I see in the Netherlands, in some Scandinavian countries, how much better they are with longer term prevention programs than we are, uh, I think we have a lot to learn from those countries, you know, initiatives that have been tested and tried out and actually work. Uh, I mean, Portugal is a good example in terms of their drug policy. Now, I know they're turning around some aspects of that now, um, but I think a lot of very exciting things that we can learn from there. And uh, I think one of the things I would certainly recommend is that we stop rolling out. We're spending an enormous amount of money on very short-term initiatives. We, If we're lucky, we pilot them sometimes, we evaluate them. And then two, three years down the line, they just disappear and we start another initiative, you know. And I think I would really call for us working across various governments, you know, having kind of crime prevention strategies uh, that are very focused, but running over a much longer period. You really need 20 to 25 year strategies to really crack um, the issue of crime in our society. Um, people who commit offences uh, have, as you know, I, I'm speaking to people who, who are very knowledgeable in this area, have a long history of adverse childhood experiences. Many of them come from significant trauma. Crime is often just a symptom of a range of other problems and there's no quick fixes. So what we're trying to do over and over in the UK, and I've seen so much of it having worked in probation and in you know um, that sort of environment, we roll out very small programs and then they don't actually really get anywhere. We fund charities, et cetera, to develop these programs and then they never really become long-term initiatives and you're not going to sort the problem out that way. So I would call for longer-term strategies that span you know, uh, uh, across governments and that you can't just do away with a, a strategy when you have a, a new government coming in. Um, I also would advocate as part of that for crime in terms of prevention to be seen much more as a public health issue and again linked to the uh, trauma that so many uh, people who offend um, a face and have faced in uh, in their early childhood and in later years. Um, it is very much a public health issue and again that is one way we also work very much in the context of a very punitive uh, society. Uh, if we look at the number of people we send to prison, we are one of the worst in, in Western Europe, as you know. There's, I reckon, and I you know, haven't really done a scientific study of it, but I reckon you can probably uh, reduce our prison population by about 20% without causing any harm to any of our communities. There are people in prison, as you know, who don't belong there. By shifting it to a public health issue, we will take some of the stigma away from crime and, and let the public and communities see it as an issue of health that, you know, that needs to be treated rather than punished, you know. And, you know, please don't think that I'm 
advocating for no punishment. I think there's a place for punishment and deterrence. Um, there are some people who are harming people to such a degree that they do need to be punished as well. There are There is a place for, for prison, but I think we can be so much more smarter with who we put in prison and who are rehabilitated and, you know, we prevent crime in the community. Um, I mean, the, you would have seen the newspaper headlines this morning of wanting to send people to Estonia now because our prisons are are full. Um, you know, I mean, what's next, isn't it? That's crazy idea in my view. That is not how we're going to prevent crime. Um, you know, so I think that is really important. And then I think the other thing that underpins prevention is stable communities and good public services. And again, with so many years of austerity, I don't need to tell you what has happened to those services. Uh, so much has disappeared, youth services, um, prevention initiatives that bring our communities together, that help them collectively address crime in partnership with police, with, you know, uh, communities. And we have a really, really big job ahead to rebuild those public services, you know, and actually put funding back in, in the system uh, that has been stripped out over the last how many years. I don't quite know how we're going to get there. The challenge is enormous. I think we've destroyed far better than we know. Uh, and that is incredibly sad. Um, you know, and I think just linked to that as well, and also something that Tom stressed is the issue of pooled budgets for particular prevention strategies. I think we work so much in silos, you know, this pot of money for the Home Office, this pot of money for the Ministry of Justice, and actually we need to bring that together. And what I would do, Tom mentioned, give people insight on what they spend on particular projects so that it can be an accountability measure, which I fully agree with, but I'd actually go one step further and actually pull budgets for particular crime prevention uh, initiatives where different departments contribute and we also contribute staff to those particular projects so that we eliminate the silos and we actually take a proper multidisciplinary look at what it is that we need to achieve. So um, I think I've probably said a lot. Uh, I hope I didn't speak like a roller coaster because that's what one does when you try and get everything in in a short space of time. But anyway, I'll pause there and, uh, you know, uh, thank you for being part of a very interesting session. Thank you so much, Rihanna. Um, I feel like I've almost met my kindred spirit today in you. Um, I found myself nodding furiously as, as you were talking and, and particularly with regard to the public health approach and also um, sort of much more consideration of, of, of the trauma that people have experienced and, and, and the impact that that has gone on to have in, in their lives. Um, so, so once again, thank you very much. That was an excellent um, resume and I appreciate, you know, five minutes isn't always a long time to get everything in, but you did extremely well. So we'll come back to you in the questions. Thank you very much. Okay, now uh, moving on to our third panellist today, Dr. Theo Gavrielides. How did I do with that surname there, Theo? Yeah, no, really good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so you're, uh, if I'm right, to say with CEO confidence of, <laughs> that you're the CEO of uh, Restorative Justice for All. Um, is that correct? Yeah, so that's right. Yeah, no, I said, I said, tap the organization, um, Restorative sort of Justice for All International Institute. Um, First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I never thought I'd give uh, evidence to a committee online. Um, but I think I think one of the things that COVID did is uh, it forced us to think differently and meet in a different way. Um, and I'm saying this because I think human nature likes habits and likes doing things over and over again. And unless we're pushed to think in a different way because we haven't got any other option, then we don't create and we don't innovate. Um, and I'm saying this because I want to push the commission a little bit. And um, so far, what's been said, I agree with everything, but I want to take it to the next level. And that's to talk about restorative justice. And I hope you know what you got yourself into when you invited me to speak to you. My background, I'm, I'm a criminal law barrister, and I ended up um, creating restorative justice for all. Um, I don't know how much you know about restorative justice, but it's all about taking 
um, conflict away from lawyers. So my family, if I own lawyers, don't love me. Um, but I strongly believe in restorative justice. Um, and we have enough evidence to at least um, support the claims that I'm going to summarise in the next four and a half minutes. Um, I, I wasn't aware of your work when I looked at the briefing paper literally this morning, because that's when I got it and I saw what levelling up means um, and what um, you want to achieve. I saw some key words, which was levelling up is being done to and for communities and we want to be doing this with communities. I saw something about com locally led and then to empower citizens. And these are all key terms that are in the restorative justice dictionary. Unfortunately, the restorative justice made a bad name because when you think of restorative justice, you think about uh, post-crime control. You think about something that happened, and then you've got mediation or conferencing or circles just trying to fix what happened. Well, in, 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 in my work um, and the work that we do at the, at the Institute, the study of justice is seen as an ethos. It's a holistic approach to addressing community tensions and antisocial behavior, but above all, which is what we think is the silent driver of all inequalities, and conflict, power abuse. It's the methodology, the biopower that addresses power abuse. While I'm, why, why do I mention this? Because you can't truly empower citizens and achieve your leveling up if you don't address the power abuse that we're currently experiencing. What does that mean? Well, we all talked about what needs to be changed, but we all talked about what needs to be changed within institutions. And the first speaker spoke about these institutional cultures, the barriers, all the sort of things that come with this when you're trying to change things. What we haven't tried to do is to truly and genuinely empower communities so that they can work with the institutions whilst we're doing the improvements with the institutions. So how do we go about doing that and how do we use restorative justice for doing that? As I said, restorative justice is an ethos. So when you get communities together to think in a holistic way where restorative justice is seen as an equality solution and not a criminal justice solution, then you start to build consensus and you start to build dialogue between communities and the powerful, whether that is a local authority, national government, the police, the prosecution service, and so on. I agree that certain things need to be mandated. I agree that the law has a place. I agree that um, um, punishment has a place, but I've got a comment in relation to that. Um, but also what needs to happen is at the same time, there needs to be genuine empowerment of the communities to take part in that. So you can't change just the system. You have to also involve those that the system is supposed to serve. Now, a little bit about punishment, because we think of punishment and we think automatically about imprisonment and incapacitation, because that's what we're taught to think about. Punishment comes from the Greek word bini, which means pain, bonus, create pain within somebody to change. That pain, I can tell you, for 80% of the, uh, of the young offenders and 65% of the offenders that end up doing the crime, crime game, reoffending is not experienced in the prison. <laughs> what I have seen being experienced, that pain and transformation, is when they actually get to understand what they've done. And that's why crime as a word does not work for me. Harm does, the harming party does, the harmed party does. And it's that harm that we need to get the other person in the community to understand, accept, embrace, and allow that pain to then transform the individual and the community alongside the criminal justice agencies. That is not necessarily done through the prison system. That is done through a brave, um, and I will say very complicated process, which could be restorative justice, but it could be you know, presented in other forms, as long as there is consensus and there are principles that have been respected. That's That's, I guess I'll stop there because 
I see this more of it as an interactive session as opposed to kind of a lecture, another lecture on restorative justice. I think the point that I'm trying to make is that if we want to change things, if we do want to level things up, if we do want to truly empower communities, we can't just do that by changing institutions, by introducing more laws and top-down structures. We also need to work from the bottom up and we need to genuinely want to do that, to empower communities to do that. And I mentioned to Ben that I talk a lot about this, but the last few years I said I need to also do something about it and present evidence. And we started in SC16, a project called Building the World's First Restorative Justice Postcode. And I run a community centre from SC16 in London, where we provide a holistic approach to antisocial behaviour and community tensions from a food bank, giving free food and clothes to people, mental health services, a gym, um, classes, all sorts of things, free mobiles, digital uh, inclusion, and at the same time, creating a partnership with community organisations, local authority and criminal justice agencies to get on the same page. Since January, we've been monitoring qualitative and quantitative the impact of this approach is going to have at the individual and community level. I'm a researcher, I wanna speak from evidence, and I gave myself five years to see on a daily basis, the people that come through the center, the impact that this approach is having and whether that is going to have any difference not only on the antisocial behavior levels, but for them and their lives, their individual lives. Yeah. And we're measuring that qualitatively and quantitatively. So very happy to submit that as a case study, support your, your evidence gathering, um, and give you the evidence that we gather. And I saw that you're probably coming next to 16 London, SC, SC London in December. I saw it on the paper, which is, I don't know, is a coincidence, but we're very welcome. You're very welcome to come to the center and see how, um, how it's done there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Theo. That was incredibly thought provoking. And um, I'd be particularly interested in, in seeing some of the, the outcomes of the innovative project that you mentioned in, in London. Um, and, and well done for, for being brave enough to come up with, with, with such a, an interesting um, programme of, of, of sort of, I assume, it's one of one of distraction, but also like you've alluded to, um, in terms of sort of antisocial behaviour, actually, um, you know, making people understand the pain that they are inflicting on others. Um, so thank you. That was that was really interesting. Okay, and um, we've got around 20 minutes um for questions. Um, so if it's okay, I'd like to move to our commissioners um to to ask them if they have any questions that they'd like to ask our three panelists this afternoon um i think you'd agree that we've had three absolutely exemplary presentations today um which i'm sure have, have certainly raised um, a, a few questions um so um if that's okay we'll we will move to our commissioners um neil i can see that you've got your hand up and then if it's okay i'll come to anita afterwards thank you so start oh, thank you well, thank you very much. Really interesting sessions, uh, very sharply defined and, and well articulated uh, views there. So thanks a lot for the, to the three present pre presenters. I've got a couple of questions, really. <clears throat> the first one's aimed at Tom, but others can comment. Our police system is actually quite old in terms of um, structure. Um, Tom's position is itself one of the last... Um, new improvements effectively to be uh, introduced which was of course a police the prime commissioner 1964 was when the current boundaries broadly speaking with some differences have were actually implemented so do we actually think that the size uh, of our and structure of our police forces is actually sufficiently nimble um going forward to deal with the challenges that uh, tom and others have um talked about because it's quite a hierarchical system. Uh, it's quite sort of siloed. Uh, when I was a member of parliament in Gloucestershire, I was struck always by the fact that so many issues were connected to Bristol, but that had a completely different policing system to the one in Gloucestershire. Uh, it's that sort of point I'm kind of making here. Um, and then the other one, again, about the police force, um, and we, this does crop up time, time, time and time again. Our, all of the policemen and, and police officers, I should say, um, 
au fait and comfortable with some of the issues that we've actually been talking about. In other words, does the training really support it? Um, and I think that's something we also uh, need to um, uh, explore. So that's kind of my first question, which is also loaded with a few comments. Are we allowed to ask two or three questions at once, or should I? Um... Yeah, do you want to ask your second question now, Neil? And then I want to move on to Anita, but if there is time, we'll, we'll come back to you if you have a third. Is that okay? Thank you, yeah. I think um, prevention is the obvious thing. I say that in the dentistry, I say it in everything else. Um, um, and I think that the tool that we've really got is education. Um, and um, I was wondering if we should really be thinking about how we tool up our school system uh, to be much more supportive and much more capable of identifying children who might be sort of heading in the wrong direction, so to speak. And this is also about family life or not having a family life as well. Um, and so I do think that we need to be much cuter about joining up social services um, and, and the, the activities that we want to see happening in schools. Um, Anita mentioned one or two uh, observations in terms of Scandinavia, I think she, she was talking about, and, and, and others. She's absolutely right. Um, Finland is a really good example, uh, incidentally, uh, of having um, basically social workers in school supporting children uh, and are helping to identify children who might be heading into difficulties. And I think this is something that the Commission might want to uh, think about. And I was wondering if Rihanna had, had any comments. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Neil. Um, can I ask um, who would like to um, respond? Uh, Tom, would you like to respond in the first instance to, to Neil's questions? The police, in many ways, are still appropriate in the structure that they are for responding to serious crime issues that we'd want to see dealt with, albeit they can't possibly keep up with the, the ocean of organised drug trade and things like that. You can't police your way out of that issue. But in terms of public safety, there's lots of things the current policing structure does very well. There's two core things I'd like to see change. And it kind of, I think earlier when I was talking about pooled budgets, I have actually written to government saying, can you devolve pooled budgets, please? But in lieu of something more ambitious like that, uh, and also the fact that policing have a certain amount of money, in a sense, to firefight with, so serious emerging threats to children, organised uh, child abuse, um, modern slavery, big, big, very resource intensive things. If we, uh, if we were to have that top sliced away from us, for example, then we would be struggling to firefight, notwithstanding the fact we really do want more preventative spend. So the two big opportunities, I think, are um, something that makes it more mandatory so that it's not to the whims of local leadership to connect policing with local authorities and integrated care systems, such that there has to be more pooled funding and preventative spend. And I think just making sure that the police don't see it as something that they should be part of the conversation, but not really contributing to. That's the kind of reform I'd like to see in that bit. So that's about really building on some of the examples I gave before and making sure they evolve and develop and don't disappear or stay too small scale. The other part of that is much more flexibility in how we spend uh, criminal justice money on things like prison places and probation. With, I mean, it's been alluded to by other speakers already, with the number of people going to prison, huge huge wasted opportunities to spend that money earlier on and what and most people agree with that i find i speak to people in probation who agree with it people in prison what we need to do is find the legal mechanisms which make that happen and don't just allow lots of good well-meaning local conversations which in at the end of the day can't go anywhere i'll give you a really quick example to illustrate a point we've helped set up one of the country's first problem solving courts in the country, which again is for women who were definitely going to prison without this, bringing multidisciplinary teams together, a lot of resource contributed in kind uh, to create a rehabilitation package and the judge develop a bit of a longer term relationship with the women going through the process. It's already working really well, um, but we really don't have the resources to do it properly justice. Probation have the resources to a degree, 
and they could fund it to us, but the legal framework literally won't allow it and their funding conditions literally won't allow it. And we're just stuck with bureaucracy conditions and legislation that stop us from doing it. So we need some legal flexibility and reform. And just super quickly on the education point, I know it's not for me, but a couple of real simple things which go towards some of the stuff I've seen that works is um, the power of sports and arts for young people to be transformative whether it's a window into restorative conversations or a window into education about misogyny or a window into having their own home problems identified. It's not a nice to have, it's profound. And then two other points really quickly. Um, sometimes to engage with people who really need support and it can be empowering support, not you know stigmatizing, knock on the door from social work or you're in trouble. We need much more investment in outreach some children's centres and community centres do truly amazing things and some people do voluntarily go there, but they're not always getting to the people they need because there isn't that we're going to actively go out, seek you out, invite you for free meals and coffee to just build friendships first and then get help. Then the final part of the ingredient, which is wrapped up in all of that in different orders and cycles, is the role of peer workers. I know you all have come across that before in various contexts, but when you work with somebody in the community who might have be a victim of long-term domestic abuse and a crack addiction tied up with that and risk of homelessness and a parent, when you support them and they come through it and they end up helping other people, not only are they this amazing role model for other people in crisis, not only is their new role given part of their kind of long-term success um, and can help lots of others, but to really capture how powerful that can be, they need to be properly rewarded. There's a lot of peer roles, and it's doing loads of great things for them and other people in the community. But in the end, it sometimes falls into a bit of exploitation, really, because they're essentially doing great intervention work, but then they're not getting paid, and they're not getting rewarded, and then there isn't that long-term plan for them. And then you miss out on that extra bit of community growth that could come from kind of finishing the job as it were in terms of the support you give them uh, i'll leave there's loads more to say but i'll leave it there thanks thanks tom um if Thank it's you. okay I, I am i am going to move on to anita now um who's been waiting patiently um to ask questions and then if we get chance lara i'll ask you to come in as well um so don't can worry, i I'll just stick it in the chat it was, it was a comment more than a question so don't worry about okay. that that, thanks very much, Lara. That that's great. Um, Anita. Yeah. Um, I think one of the interesting things about some of the dialogue we've had today already is about how the system, the criminal justice system, works. In that, if I'm thinking about, we've got a system that's roots are really embedded in the Victorian time, with layers of welfare state that's post-war, Second World War. What we're not thinking about is how we make this system that we have fit for the 21st century. And I think that's a challenge. We tinker around the edges with the institutions as they exist, rather than thinking about how do we restructure it? And I think a lot of that comes from the, the contributions we've had about thinking not in silos, but across systems, not necessarily top down, but bottom up. And how do we get the, the institutions and communities working together? So that's my comment. But the question I was gonna ask was, especially the first two speakers talked about a public health approach. What, and it's one of those issues that comes up in criminal justice quite a lot, we see the need for a public health approach to criminal justice problems in inverted commas. What do you think are the barriers to actually getting more of a, that public health approach interaction? I mean, that was, I mean, I think we've got to think big and differently but I also think there may be some small wins because I think it's potentially about mindsets and how do we change people's views about the world and how do we get that to happen so that was my question. Thanks Anita. Rihanna would you like to come in on that I know you talked about um, a public health approach. Yeah um, thanks Paula. Um, I think that's a really interesting question and for me personally I think politics get in the way uh, to a large degree. You know, the whole rhetoric around tough on crime and, you know, we building up for an election. I'm already dreading what's going to happen, isn't it? We could just see where it goes. 
Um, but I think that is part of the reasons. There's a reluctance to let go of that rhetoric and actually look at the issues more transparently, more openly. So I would certainly, I mean, one of the things that I would really look at is, and, you know, we have a lot of experience of that in, in the work that we do in my organization. You can imagine when you want to talk to the public about, um, you know, programs for perpetrators of sexual abuse and rehabilitating people, you get a whole barrage of resistance, you know, because the stigma against sexual crime is far worse than against any other crime. We are prepared to forgive murderers and robbers, but never uh, people who harm other people sexually. Um, and, you know, by that, I'm not saying that we don't recognize the harm that is caused through that. But in terms of the public health uh, debate, we've been having very honest conversations with communities, with members of the public. We do a lot of, you know, going around and talking to people and influencing people. And we talk to them about, give them the kind of true facts of, you know, this pedophile, you know, that's not language that we prefer to use, but this pedophile, you are so much talking about who is that person where does that person come from you know what has that person experienced as a child what are the kind of needs of that person what is the true information you know in terms of rehabilitation and you know behavior be changed and those kind of things and I must say it's a lot of effort but we do influence people I mean now at the point that you know, when someone posts on something on social media saying this organization shouldn't be supported because of the work they do, then we get other people, ordinary members of the public responding, saying, no, they do good work. They do this, you know, so I can actually see the years that we have put, um, you know, aside to really emphasize and have those conversations in our various communities have really borne fruit. And I think we must just continue, you know, to to tap on that door. And I think the other thing to do is to make the financial argument. You know, very often people will only change if they can see the financial benefit. So we need to show the cost effectiveness of doing things from a public health perspective as opposed to from a punitive just a, a kind of narrow criminal justice approach. I mean, how much is it to put, we know those figures, are, you know, how much do we spend on someone in prison every year? Is it 45, 46,000 still? Um, you know, now you, there's a lot you can do with that sum of money per person, you know, by just shifting it towards a preventative and a more public health approach. So I think it's just, again, we need to get together and work out a strategy in terms of how you shift attitudes from where we are at the moment, which is very narrow, very short system, very short sighted, very reactive to where we want to get um, at the end of the day. And it, it's possi possible. And as I said in my initial input, there, we can learn from other countries. There are models. We don't necessarily have to invent it all from scratch. We can learn from people who have actually experimented with this and have actually learned through through their efforts. Thank you, Rihanna. And I'm so sorry that we haven't had more time to take more questions on this particular panel. Um, but I would encourage people, if they do have any sort of further information they would like to share on this to, to send in written submissions. And I'm particularly interested in, um, we talked a little earlier about the impact of adverse childhood experiences and, and trauma on offending so if anybody and also additionally um if anybody has any evidence about women's centers um we'd be really particularly grateful to receive any evidence about those so um please please um do do send into the email address that that ben popped in in the chat a few minutes ago um so i'd like to thank our extremely um well our excellent um, commentators, our panelists for that for that first panel um, this afternoon. Uh, you're more than welcome to stay for the second panel if you would like to. I know Rihanna, I believe you're appearing on the second panel too, um, so we shall be we shall be seeing you again. Um, but 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 Tom and Theo, um, thank you very much indeed for your expertise.